So today's agenda. Very quickly, we're going to cover how a motor works uh, a little bit on motor performance. The big key here is I want to get you up to speed on what a speed torque curve is for a motor. Really, that's the takeaway from what would have been the first two to three hours of talk. You just need to know how a speed torque curve works and what it means. You know, later on, you guys can go back and to the extent you're interested, you can study the slides, Google Internet, whatever, and figure out all the physics of how do you get to the speed torque curve. But for today, you just need to know what that is, and we're going to go forward. We will then spend a little bit more time on the talent, on the overview, what all of the aspects that are programmable, what do you have to worry about. I uh, have a little insight into the firmware upgrades that will be coming for the talents next year and some of the new features that will be showing up. Um, we have a pretty good relationship with Omar, the guys over across the road, and so we talk to them quite often. We'll talk about encoders. Uh, we'll do kind of a halfway in-depth thing, talk about the different styles of encoders, but it probably won't be a college-level depth course. And then we're going to dive right into how do you configure one of these things, where you've got a talon, a motor, and an encoder. Uh, we have got some ways to, in essence, change what we call the physical plant, add a lot of inertia to a motor. How does that change things? Or, with this fan thing, add a lot of drag. So um, we'll do a velocity loop, a position loop, and those two things will really be your fundamental for anything you want to tune. It's all variants on a theme of those two. There is a combination of those called motion magic that is in the talent. Uh, I think a year and a half or two years ago, they offered up a complete motion control profile. Anybody use the full motion control profile? Okay, it's unbelievably capable and pretty freaking complicated. There are a lot of moving parts. And as much time as we've spent on it, I don't even use it. Um, what Cross the Road did last year was they introduced, in essence, a dumbed-down version called Motion Magic, which is really slick. Um, it is a way where you've got to know about two things more than a regular velocity or position loop, and it can help you on a position application really solve some problems. So we've got that last. Um, we'll see if we get to it. Uh, it's really, really cool. So those are the things I really intend to teach today as far as what we're going to do. The talon can do a lot more. The majority of it beyond this you will not likely use. And if you do and you have questions, you can always feel free to contact us and we'll uh, provide insight best we can. So let's jump right in. So this is when you need to buckle your seat belts because we're going to move pretty quick. Um, right hand rule. Anybody ever heard of the right hand rule? All right. Basically, you've got current going through a wire, you've got a magnetic field, and you have also got a force exerted on that wire. Right-hand rule, that's what pushes a wire in a magnetic field with current flowing through it. There you've got a magnet and a wire, and indeed, if you put current through that wire, with a magnetic field, force is going to push that wire in a particular direction. And how this all works is very well understood, and so if I go too fast, that's the beauty of the Internet today. Here you have an example of a field. There's a wire, and a field is built around it when you put current through it. When you put a wire in this field and put current through it, that's how the fields interact, and a bunch of interesting physics happen, and it pushes that wire that way. If I put two of them in there, that wire is being pushed up, that wire is being pushed down. A little foreshadowing. If I actually put that on something that spins, that wire gets pushed down, that one gets pushed up, wants to make that go in a circle. And indeed, that's how a motor works. You've got these wires in that field and they're wanting to twist. Key thing is, when that thing inverts, everything's backwards. I really need to switch the wires. And that's what this commutator is for. Your battery, some brushes, and as that thing turns, it changes how the current is flowing and it always keeps things lined up so that the forces on those wires are always going the right way. There's a graphic in the right here that really shows you what's going on. That's your plus, that's your minus. Those contact the different parts of the commutator. That changes and the colors, the pole of the magnet here in your rotor. And you've got one pole here of a permanent magnet in your motor. There's your other pole. And this is exactly how almost all first motors are made. And indeed, 
you'll see this one go green and it's being pulled towards that magnet. Till it gets right there, then it turns off. This one's red being pulled towards the green magnet. That's how a motor works. So everything you ever wanted to know in five minutes. Um, this is this is not a first motor, but this is a pretty excellent graphic uh, where you can see all of the different parts. Um, that's the uh, the armature. You got all your wires and uh, extra metal to try to get all your flux, the magnetic field, as dense as possible. Your commutator. Here are those brushes, and they touch the different segments of metal here, and that's how you keep the polarity lined up on the right part of the armature, so it's always being pulled. And you know, one segment pulls, and then all of a sudden it turns off, and the next one's turned on, and it pulls. And that's what keeps the motor going. You can almost think of it as a zone headed towards this magnet. That zone of, of armature elements are always polarized correctly to be pulled towards that, even though it's spinning. Um, and so indeed, as we've learned, current magnetic field force, you get torque. What on earth is back EMF, electromotive force? A motor is always two things. I put voltage in and it makes current flow and I get torque out. And so as I put current through the motor, I get torque out and it wants to spin. A motor is also a generator. If I spun that shaft, it will develop a voltage across the terminals. So if I put a voltmeter on that thing, and I spun the shaft, it's not hooked up to any battery, you suddenly see a voltage. So these first motors are one and the same. I can put a voltage on it and it develops torque, or I can put torque on it and it will develop a voltage. It is a generator and a motor all at the same time. And in a motor, at any given moment, the generated voltage is what we call back EMF. So the way you get the voltage is you have a wire moving through a magnetic field. The amount of field strength and the velocity that wire is going through the field determines the voltage. And so you kind of have to think of a motor as two things going on simultaneously. It's a generator, and it's something I'm putting current into, and it's making torque. Both of those are happening simultaneously. You overlay them and do a bunch of math. And that tells you what you might actually measure if you looked at something. So at the end of the day, and if it feels like you're being overwhelmed, I mean, we're covering in 10 minutes here what you would spend a semester in college doing. There's a little physics behind all of this. At the end of the day, this is a motor. When you think about electrically what is going on, I have got my shaft. It has got some speed omega, some torque j, of course, in the engineering world, we could never call it speed and torque. You need some figure someplace that's hard to remember, but omega and j. This is a generator. Based on its speed, it is going to generate a voltage. And the voltage, think of this as a battery, the voltage on those terminals is going to be directly proportional to speed. And that will always be true for a given motor. A motor also has some resistance. And that is the copper resistance of the wire that's in the motor and all the different pathways. There is also some inductance. And inductance in 30 seconds or less, if you think about a copper pipe in your house, and you think about water flowing through that pipe, and you suddenly slam a valve off, you will hear what's called water hammer. And it's because that water had momentum, and I suddenly tried to stop it, that water did not want to stop, and I get a pressure spike when that valve slams shut. Inductance in an electrical circuit causes the same phenomenon. It makes current not want to stop. But rather than a pressure spike, you would get a voltage spike. And so you can really think for the sake of today, the inductance in a motor creates inertia to the current. If I spin my current up, it does not want to instantly stop. It will generate its own voltage to try to keep the current from stopping. So just think of it as adding inertia. So in my motor, when I look at the electrical representation of a motor, I have a generator, I have a resistor, and whatever current I'm putting through that motor 
That resistor, first of all, is a voltage drop. It is also a big old heater. And so I squared R, your current squared times that resistance is how much heat you are puking out in that motor. And at some point, that motor starts to smoke. And as we all know, in any electronic part, when all the smoke leaks out, it doesn't work anymore. They only make them with so much smoke inside, and when it all leaks out, you're done, you need a new one. So if you see smoke leaking, you want to try to catch that early, because if you leave some smoke in there, there's a chance it might work for the next match and the rest of the day. So at the end of the day, what goes on here is a motor is running at some speed. There is a certain amount of back EMF, back EMF voltage here. I've got whatever battery voltage I apply here. The differential across here is going to determine my current. So in a nutshell, I hook this thing up to a battery. That's not spinning at all. There's no voltage here. My battery voltage is completely across that resistor. And so when I slam a motor on a battery, my instantaneous current is the battery voltage over the resistance of that motor, and my current's going right through the roof. And you've all seen that. You put a battery on a stalled motor, things get really interesting. What happens, though, is that current through the motor makes torque. That torque starts the motor spinning. And we have learned that a motor is always a generator. And so as that speed increases, the voltage, or the back EMF across here, increases and starts to counteract the voltage across that resistor. And that voltage minus that voltage is what gives you the voltage across the resistor. So at the end of the day, what happens? As the motor speeds up, the current flowing through the, the whole loop starts to go down. The faster the motor goes, the more voltage it develops. That's the opposite of this voltage. And this voltage on the resistor is less and less and less and less and less. Now, if that motor goes fast enough, the voltage across that resistor is zero, and I have no current flowing through the motor. How much torque does the motor make with zero current? Secret answer is zero. Well, how can my rotor be spinning? And it won't. It will start slowing down. And so when you plug a motor in, what happens is you have an initial big burst of current, the rotor starts to spin up, the back EMF of the motor starts to eat up the voltage that's across that resistor. The current goes down and down and down until you reach an equilibrium point where this is not quite battery voltage. That leaves just enough voltage across the resistance of the motor to give me enough current to make it run at that speed. It doesn't actually get to pure battery voltage speed. Okay? So, and there's tons on the internet that will walk you through this. So if your head is spinning, this is important to know, and go spend some time uh, studying that. At the end of the day, volts equal speed, amps equal torque. That's what happens in a motor. You want to know what the torque in the motor is? What current is flowing through it? You want to know how fast it's going? Look at the voltage, but you have to keep in mind, your voltage is always my generated voltage and then whatever my current is times that, times that resistor. There's always two parts in the voltage. At the end of the day, this is a speed torque curve. And what this amounts to is when I take a motor and slam it across the battery, I'm instantly going to be right here. I have got my full battery voltage across resistance that's just the copper of the motor. And that current is going right through the roof. It's that battery across that resistor, and that is going to make a ton of torque. It's also going to make a ton of heat, I squared R. And keep in mind that I squared thing is not your friend. As motors slow down and you load them, they don't build heat linearly. They build heat exponentially. So a stalled motor, you know, start a very short stopwatch. You are going to build heat like crazy. Uh, so what happens, I plug the motor in, I'm right here, I have lots of torque, and so my motor starts to speed up, because in this particular case, I just have a shaft here, I got no load on it. So when I turn that thing on, I'm going to start speeding up. As I speed up, the generated voltage of the motor is going to increase and counteract my battery voltage across the resistor. 
and I am going to lose current as my speed increases. And that will continue to happen. I will go faster and faster and faster, and I will stop right about here. I can't get clear to here because then my generated voltage is exactly my battery voltage and I have no current to overcome the drag of the bearings or the air losses of the rotor spinning. They're small little thingies that make a motor consume some amount of power to just spin its own rotor. And so at the end of the day, what you need to know out of the spiel you just heard is every motor has a speed torque curve. If I put a given voltage on that motor, that voltage over that motor's internal resistance is going to tell me my stall current or my stall torque. And every motor has got a voltage constant and a speed constant where I could say, okay, if I got this many amps, what torque is that? Literally, I could put amps on this scale as well and just get it scaled right. Uh, but torque and amps for a given motor are one and the same time sum factor. So slamming on the battery, big current, as it accelerates, I go faster and faster and faster, but that limits the amount of current I can get through the internal resistance of the motor. My max torque is less and less and less, and eventually I'm going to sit with full battery voltage and idle right about there. So for any motor, you simply look at its full voltage free speed, and that's some volts and some speed, you put a dot there, you look at the current or the torque, you put a dot there, and you draw a straight line. And as I spin that motor up, as I grab the shaft and start slowing it down, which, hey, guess what? We have welding gloves here. Guess what I'm going to do later on? We're going to grab that shaft and slow it down. Um, what's going to happen is that motor will actually run up that curve. If I were to grab that motor and slow it down to say 3,000 RPM, and it's just this motor and it's me with my hands on it and I've got it held at 3,000 RPM and my fingers aren't on fire quite yet, what's my torque gonna be at 3,000 RPM and what's my current? Very easy, 3,000 intersects right there and so I'm going to be at say 1.1 Newton meters, and if there was a scale on here, I would know what amperage. A sim motor is about 130 amps right here, so I'd be about at 60 amps. So if I grab that motor shaft, if I had 12 volts on this, it's running full speed, and I grab that and start squeezing on it, when I get it slowed down to 3,000 RPM, with my calibrated fingers, I hold it exactly at 3,000 RPM, that motor is now going to be pulling 60 amps and be generating about 1.1 newton meters of torque and that's because my speed torque curve told me that. So a motor operating in what we call open loop, big term for today, open loop, it's a battery and a motor hooked together, it's going to want to do exactly that. It's going to go that speed and as I start to load it, could be with my fingers, could be some part of your robot, it is going to follow that line up and down. As you slow it down, it's going to be on that line someplace. Now, that's if I put 12 volts on that motor. But let's say I only put 11 volts on it. What does that look like? Looks like this. For that same motor, here you've got the curve we just looked at. That's 12 volts, that's what it's going to do. If I only put 11 volts on it, it's only going to go that fast. And as I squeeze it with my fingers, it's going to follow that line. And with 11 volts, my stall torque and stall current is not going to be as high. I've only got 11 volts across that resistance, not 12 volts. And so 11 volts will make it go slower, full speed. 11 volts won't create quite as much stall current. You draw a line between those two points. That's the speed torque line for 11 volts on that motor. And as I were to dial the voltage down, you can see what happens here. They're all linear lines, they're all parallel, and they just keep walking down to near zero. So when you think about a motor, that's what's going on. I've got a speed torque curve for a specific voltage, and it's very predictable what that motor is going to do. And depending upon the specs of the motor, sometimes they share them, sometimes they don't, 
there is what's called a, uh, a voltage constant and a torque constant. And it basically says this many amps times this torque constant is going to give me this much torque. And these many volts times this voltage constant is going to give me these, these volts. There's actually a bunch of math where those two constants are always related. If you do anything to a motor to take the voltage constant up, you're going to change the torque constant too. They're heavily, they're completely related. You can't say, well, I want a motor that only takes one volt and does these magical things torque-wise. They're, they're related. There are some physics limitations when you design a motor. So that is a combination of speed torque curves for a sim motor as I were to apply different voltages open loop. So if you wanted to know what speed torque curve open loop looked like for six volts, it's that green line, it's this right here. That's the speed it would run, and as I grabbed it with my fingers, it's going to do that. It's eventually going to stall right there, and that's that. Okay? Everybody got this somewhat in their head. Any quick questions anybody has? Okay. Yes? As you put more resistance on it at the lower voltage, it's going to take less resistance to get it to the same point, correct? Say that again? You're, you're, you're robot. Oh, you mean with my fingers, not only right? Yes. yes. Yes, as I grab it less, it takes less torque, which means it's going to speed up. The generator is going to make more voltage, which is going to counteract the resistor, so my current is going to go down. And basically, you're running up and down that line. And it's purely related to how much torque I need, and then that'll tell you where you're at. Okay? All right. Key thing is open loop. Battery, motor, no intelligence. This is what happens. You will then see curves that look similar to this. Um, That's pretty common you'll see for a motor where they say, okay, RPM, and they'll show you, it won't be percent, it'll be whatever the number is. This is my free speed at some voltage. They will say, this is my free speed RPM at this voltage. For example, for one of these sims, it's about 5,400 RPM at 12 volts. And they will also tell you that, hey, at stall, this is going to be my torque, and this is the current you are going to pull at stall. Now, one interesting thing that, that happens, when you take a dead cold motor and you slam a big battery on it, your current will spike up to whatever that voltage across that resistance is. But that's a big old heater. And as that copper gets hot, its resistance goes up. So what you will find that if you were to dyno a motor, or quite frankly, just take the copper and put a big battery across it, your current will spike up, and then it will start coming down as the copper heats up because the resistance is going up. And it will eventually reach equilibrium to where it's shedding heat as fast as you're putting heat in it, up to the point all the smoke leaks out. So, key thing to know, the peak torque you can get out of a motor is a lot higher when that thing is stone cold. So, at the end of a two-minute FRC match where your drive motors are smoking hot, you do not have the ability to get anywhere near as much torque out of them because, in essence, your resistance has gone up. Okay? All right. When you think about a motor and getting work done, if I am pushing really hard on this table, but nothing's moving, I am not doing any work. I might be getting tired, but I'm not doing any work. There's nothing moving, I'm gaining nothing. And if I happen to be running across the room, but I'm not carrying any weight with me, I'm just going 900 miles an hour, I'm not really doing any work either. Technically, I'm moving my own body, but we're uh, simplifying things for today's discussion. So on a motor, if I am going full speed, but there's absolutely nothing connected to the shaft, I am not doing any work. It's exciting, it's fun to watch, but there's nothing meaningful happening. No work is getting done. If my rotor is stalled, lots of torque, but nothing's moving, no work is getting done. The maximum work that you can get done out of a motor when you think about doing something. Uh, for example, this year's FRC. I need to pick a robot up off the ground and get it two feet in the air. What were they thinking? 
um, and I need to do that really fast. Well, if my motor is running right here, okay, it's going really fast, but I'm getting almost no work done. When I look at those gear ratios, it's going to take me forever to get climbed up there because I'm going to need a zillion to one ratio for my motor to go that fast because I can't make any torque there. Let's say I just wrap the rope directly around the motor shaft. Boy, I'm going to have big torque in the motor right away because that thing's going to stall. But it, eventually, it doesn't actually have enough torque to wrap that rope around the, the rotor and pick the robot up. I have to put some gear ratio in there. And where I am going to get the most work done, and this is exactly what we did on the climber this year, is I want my motor at, let's say, 12 volts, whatever the speed torque curve looks like, I want to add gear ratio to that until it runs right about in the middle as it climbs. Peak power out of a motor is equidistance between that point and that point. And so your power curve looks like that and the high spot is always in the middle. It is halfway up your speed torque curve. So like on the climb, if you want to get that thing done in the shortest time possible, you want that motor, and it's not like you want to run it at 6 volts. You put it at 12 volts, and you want to load it until it runs half speed. If it's faster than that, you would climb faster by putting some more gear ratio in it. If it's slower than that, you've got to take some gear ratio on X the other way around. But that's what you want to do. So that's how you extract the most power out of a motor, is you load it to half speed of whatever its free speed is at the voltage you're running it at. Now, lots of times we don't care about extracting max power out of the motor and you put gear trains on it for different reasons. But that's max power. You've then got efficiency. This is battery energy in to work coming out of the motor. Well here, absolutely nothing is happening. I've just got a big old heater and so my efficiency is zero. Here, I'm spinning but nothing's hooked to the shaft so my efficiency is zero. Turns out, and this is where this will look different for different motors, um, up here is where your max efficiency is as far as work you can get done per battery amount of energy. So if first matches actually lasted 30 minutes instead of two minutes, you'd run a lot of your motors right here because you don't have enough battery to go 30 minutes and you're trying to figure out how to make that motor convert battery power to work as efficiently as possible. You're going to get your work done a lot slower than if you were running at mid-speed, but you'll actually consume that energy more efficiently. Okay? Now, it turns out in two minutes with one of these batteries, it is virtually impossible to drain a fully charged battery, and so in first, this is somewhat irrelevant. In the real world, you do have to worry about these things. So, first motors. This is an example of a SIM motor, big motor, Lots of copper, spins relatively slow, it's heavy, there's no fan, but big thermal mass. You can be really, really mean to these motors and probably not hurt them. Um, they are pretty indestructible, and for anybody that wants to build a drivetrain that for the most part is bulletproof, put sims on it. You're just not going to hurt it. You then got a baby version of that, a bag motor. Same architecture, there's no fan in it, but it's a lot smaller. You get a lot less power out of it, but it's a lot smaller motor. So less copper, medium speed, it runs faster. Um, doesn't weigh a lot, there's no fan in it. I would tell you, you can overheat and wreck those things in a pretty big hurry. And the burning varnish smells really, really bad. Usually when all the smell leaks out, that's when that motor doesn't work anymore. Then you've got these smaller motors like a 775 that is fan cooled. I've now got a fan in there dragging air across the windings. That helps get the heat out of the motor. So when that motor is running at speed, boy, it's pretty amazing because it shed the heat out of there and that motor will stay cool. How well does that fan work near stall? Not well at all. And so when you talk about this I squared R thing, Current squared times resistance equals your heat. Well, as I stall that motor, my current is going up, my heat is going up exponentially, 
and my fan cooling is going down exponentially. The ability to overheat one of these motors at slow speed and high torque happens in the blink of an eye. But as far as the horsepower you can get out of that motor per weight, properly used, is pretty amazing. Turns out the 775 has exactly the same wattage output as a sim. You can get exactly the same power out of them, but it's like a Formula One race car. You better have that thing set up to do exactly one thing. You try to take a Formula One race car and drive to the grocery store to pick up groceries, it seems like a simple task. It's not going to go so well, because it was not designed to do that. Those cars will explode with heat if they're not at 100 miles an hour on the track. Same story here. So different motors, different weights, different copper, different cooling. It's about trying to figure out what motor is the best answer for a particular axis on your robot. And of course, speed torque curves, this is, I think, either off of X or IndyMark's site. Uh, they're pretty open with the data here. You can see uh, this is a sim. That's my, whoop. you have got your um, power, that's your efficiency, and they actually show torque and current here, and they actually show the ratios. So you've got torque over on this axis and uh, current over here. Now you will notice on a sim, my stall torque is 2.41 newton meters. On my 775, my stall torque is 0.71. You're thinking, well, that's a wussy motor. How am I going to get any work done? That thing is also spinning to beat the band. Work is speed times torque. And so work and power are the same thing. So on a 775, the peak power is about 350 watts. And on a sim, the peak power is 337 watts. 775 can actually get a little bit more work done than a sim, and it weighs a whole lot less. You just better be careful with it. Uh, on this year's robot, we actually have 775s for the drop. There's four of those things driving. And it is a constant dance. We run that thing right on the edge, heat-wise, for all the stuff I talked about. Um, you could put sims on there and just close your eyes and not pay any attention and you'd never hurt the thing. 775s, you have to be very, very careful. All right, little comparison chart here. Um, shows you cost, peak wattage, free speed, torque, weight. So example, sim, you know, power, 337 for 2.8 pounds. The 775, 350 watts for 0.74 pounds. On a drive system, you basically save two pounds per corner. So when you look at our swerve drive, that is eight pounds we save by putting 775s on there, and you actually get a little more power. You just have to be really, really careful and not overheat the motors. Yes? You might prefer this. If you're using the 775s for like drive, what do you have to do to keep from working? It's um, <coughs> understand with your robot and how your drivers drive it, what does the temperature profile look like? And start to figure out with what my driver is going to do, this is what I have to do with the current limit, either as a fixed current limit or dynamically as a current limit. And you basically choke the thing for you to say, you know what? I'm simply going to limit the current to it, and the talon will do that. And that's how you manage the heat. Uh, we'll talk about current limit a little bit later, but if you're not using current limit in the talon, you are giving up one of the most important, powerful features that thing will do to save your motors. Uh, so if you're going to design a high-performance robot, you'd much rather use 775s than SIMS because you're going to get a much bigger bang for the buck you just have a robot that's a lot more like a Formula One car than a Sherman tank. You use it at all the wrong way and it's going to blow up. Um, a given speed torque curve on a motor may not exactly accommodate what you need it to do. Like I said, on the climber, over on this thing, we wrap a big old rope around here to pick this robot. Well, as it turns out, if you just had a motor shaft on that, that thing's going way too fast, and I don't have anywhere near enough torque. So there are two 
775s, so almost a full horsepower, going each through 100 to 1 gear by accident, they weren't 100 to 1s. Mm. They were, it's written down somewhere. That's, we'll say 50 to 1. Through 50 to 1 gearboxes, um, through change coupled to this shaft, to get the speed and the torque on this shaft right, so that when you look at the diameter of the shaft, and you look at the fulcrum arm, and you look at the rope, when this thing is climbing, those motors have 12 volts on them, and they are pulled down to about half speed. And this thing will climb from the ground to the top in about two seconds if the drive team runs it wide open. Now there's actually, if we had time, they had buttons where it went a lot slower because uh, it would pretty much rip the tower down when it got to the top if you didn't stop it. So you put gearboxes on these things to then get the speed torque curve changed to what you actually need for your job. The motor is still the motor, but the gearbox will slow down the speed and increase the torque. And you can simply take the torque curve, do a little bit of math, and you have a different torque curve of what's coming out of the gearbox. Lots of choices here. That's a bag motor on one of the VEX blocks. We love these things. Uh, you've got the different stages, and you can do anything you want. Uh, how many folks are familiar with the VEX gearboxes? The, basically, um, you can put that on a full sim. You can put that on the smaller motors. And there are stages you put in there. And they're planetary stages. And stages, there's a, a 3, a 4, a 5, a 7, a 9, and a 10. And you can put that ratio in each of those stages. And they're, um, they, they just all multiply. So if I want 100 to 1, I put two 10 to 1 stages in there. It packages up very nice. And I have a 100 to 1 gearbox. If I want a 3 to 1, I just put one 3 to 1 stage in there. And I have that. We use those almost exclusively any place where we need to really slow things down. We do not use them for the main drive. In a planetary system, you are moving a lot of gears. It's wonderful, it's compact, but there's a lot of gears moving. We tend to not use them for high speed, low ratio step downs. Uh, that's actually got what they call a uh, simile on it, where you've got a 775 going into a little spur gear, just one gear and one big gear and then that comes out. We tend to use those for our higher speed applications. Uh, but here you see a big sim on their adapter that feeds into those gearboxes. That's three sims on a drive gearbox. That's a couple of other 775s or 550s tied together to drive that same gearbox. That's an Andy Mark motor with a, uh, I think it's a, probably a 70 to 1 gear ratio on there. So lots of choices in first of how I hang a gearbox on my motor to get that ultimate speed torque curve where I need it for my application. It depends what you're doing. Okay, yes? For the situation where you've got like two 775s yep. um, in tandem on the same gearbox, and you're trying to, say, do current limit to keep it cooking them, yep. is it valid to just watch current draw on one of them, or do you really want to watch everything that's like together? If the motors were perfectly balanced, which they're not, you could technically watch current limit on one, and it would be OK. But they're not perfectly balanced, so you just turn the current limit on in both panels, and that way you don't have a problem. Well, the reason, the reason I asked is because the new victors out can slave those to the talent, Correct. They, but they don't have current measurement limit. Slave. Uh, I have not studied the spec on the new version, so there's no current limit in those. Slave okay, them. Here, here is my advice. In the new Victors, what you have is something, and we'll talk more about this, that is $40 cheaper. It's a $50 part instead of a $90 part. And it does a lot. I didn't know there was no current limit in there. If you can scrape up however many talents you're going to use, and you're not using more than 16, because that's all the more channels you have, if you can scrape up $40 for each of those axes, use a full-blown Talon SRX so you have current limit. The only time you should be using a Victor is if $40 difference is what's going to determine whether you have a robot or not. Yes, Mark? Uh, if uh, you're using the two motors, doesn't um, don't you slave them? You can current limit one and slave the other? Even Correct. Even though it won't be exact? Correct. 
in essence, you could get to the point, in essence, you have current limited both, but your one your slave motor could be a little bit higher current before this one actually turns off. All right. So yeah, I did not know that the new Victors don't have current limit. That is a huge reason to probably go with the town if you can come up with a $40 differential. All right, motors and gearboxes. Heat, where does the heat come from? The copper. Here you see the copper. That's where the heat's coming from. So when you look at a motor, when you put current through it, that's the heat source. And keep in mind, it takes a while for that heat to get out of there. And so you, you use the motor and say, oh, it's just fine. I can still put my hand on just fine. Yeah, check it in 10 minutes when that heat actually soaks out of that thing and makes it to the outside. You have to remember the wiring and other things inside can be destructively hot before you feel anything on the outside of the motor. All right. Too bad. All right. So we talk about putting a specific voltage on a motor. I put 12 volts on my motor. Or I take a 6-volt battery and I put 6 volts on my, my motor. Well, how does the talon actually change the voltage to a motor? It does not actually put in an extra resistor or a rheostat and turn it down. It uses what we call pulse width modulation, PWM. And this is where that inertia we talked about comes in. And so what goes on here is I, in essence, have a switch, an on-off switch inside of the town. And that on-off switch can do two things. It can give me 12 volts. It can give me zero volts. That's all that is ever coming out of these green and white wires. It's, it's either 12 volts or it's zero volts. But the talent has the ability to turn that switch on and off really fast. So it turns out it turns that switch on and off 15,600 times a second. And so that's the frequency at which it can turn that on and off. It can also decide, I want to turn it on just a little bit. And then in one fifteen thousandth of a second, it does that again. Or it could say, I want to turn it on a lot more. That's a 50% duty cycle. 50% on, 50% off. 75%, 75 on, 25 off, or 25%, 25 on, 75 off. When you look at the inertia of the current going through the motor, and there's some other electronics in play here, what really happens is the motor sees that as six volts. The motor really doesn't know the difference because we are changing it so fast. The motor thinks that is six volts. And you just have to trust me. There's about an hour of discussion. This would all make perfect sense. But the Talon can do a 50% duty cycle with a 12 volt supply. And if we were to put an oscilloscope, which we actually have back here on the motor, you would see that switching on and off at 15,600 times a second. Why that speed? It's slightly out of the audio range most people can hear. If that was lower, you'd hear that thing scream like a speaker. Okay? So, and actually young people may actually hear that thing whine. Most of us have been around for a while, wrecked our hearing, and you don't hear 16,000 hertz anymore. Um, why not faster? Because the faster you go, you actually do start shedding heat into your control system. And so most of these motor systems chop at a, a thing right above audio and no higher. So that is how a talon controls the voltage. Know that and just assume when the talon gives me six volts, the motor sees six volts, that's really going on, but I don't really have to know how. Just know that's how a talon controls it. Now, why do you do that? it keeps the talon very, very cool. The talon does not dissipate any heat when it's off, and it also doesn't dissipate any heat when you simply put a big old crowbar across the battery going to the motor. And the reason you do all this is to keep the heat out of the control system. That's how you can put 100 amps through a talon and it doesn't get hot, because it's either on or it's off. If we were doing that with a variable resistor, what you are doing is throwing away whatever heat you're not putting in the motor. You're putting that into the talent. And as we've learned, all the smoke quickly leaks out and it won't work anymore. So pulse width modulation, that's how we control 
the voltage going to a motor. Um, yes. I just want to make everyone aware that, that that is not the same PWM as the signals coming out of the Robo Rio. Very good point. That's old. That's another discussion, but they do not. They are not the same thing. Right. They are both pulse with modulation, from a technical term standpoint, but they are two different things. Okay. All right. So if I hooked up a bunch of instrumentation and to my motor, what I would see is if the talent was attempting to make my motor go faster and then go slower, um, it would change the pulse widths, and my current does not change instantaneously. My current ramps up, I turn my power off, it ramps down. I turn my power on, it ramps back up, and that's what your current would actually look like. So, and this gets back to the inertia, the inductance in the motor is what does that. So, for those that are interested, get on Google, you can study to your heart's content, and this is a electrical engineering college course, but that's what goes on. That's how the talent does all of this. 